But this morning the message is the last part in the four-part series on context and calling. And we've been looking at how in the center of God's eternal kingdom, he has a house. Makes sense, doesn't it? You see it in the movies about kings and queens, and we know in the monarchy in England that there's a palace, a house the king lives in. Well, God has a house, uh, and like us, God is focused on a home for his family to dwell with him. That makes sense for us, doesn't it? Having kids, you want a home, a house to make a home where you can live together with your kids, your family. Well, God has a house, and he wants his children home in his house with him. Throughout Scripture, we see that God wants to be surrounded by his children who love him and who love each other, and together with his son Jesus will inherit and rule his kingdom forever. That's just a wee statement I've put together to kind of summarize the main guts, the heart of the Father and of what this is all about, the grand purpose, the scheme of things. He wants to be with his children. You see it way back in Genesis. You see it right at the end in Revelation 21, 22. You see it through with, the, with the nation of Israel, God in the center of the community with his people there. You see it throughout the scriptures. That's the picture. The father wants to be with his children, not apart. And he wants a house set apart where he can be there with his children, not set apart from them. Sounds like a Good father to me. The house of God isn't the fullness of God's kingdom, but it is the home of the king and the king's family. And God is all about his family. So when we talk about the kingdom of God, we're talking about the dominion of God over all things. Uh, But then we talk about the house of God within the kingdom of God. That's the church. And that's what it's all about. So this isn't about your kingdom. It's about his kingdom, correct? And this isn't about just your family. This is about his family, of which you and your family are called to be a part. We're all called to reach and reconcile God's lost children back to him and to his family. And in his family home, we all learn the Father's way. We learn the Father's will, the Father's word, and how to help those God is bringing home. And that's our purpose making disciples. But we're exploring the impact uh, and context that context has on how we live out that purpose, our calling. <clears throat> context matters. And something that significantly impacts upon our perspective and response to the purpose that God has is our societal context, our cultural context. So much of life in New Zealand is based in a societal perspective of individualism. And this is tricky because if you've sort of lived most or all your life in New Zealand, then it it is just what it is. But what is it? It's hard to tell until you step out of it and look back into it. Sometimes you need to go into another nation, another culture, and then look back and go, ah, now I can see some differences. Now it's becoming more clear what life in New Zealand is like. It's so familiar to me that I wouldn't think about it until I step back and have a look. And when we look at societal life in New Zealand, a lot of it is based through a perspective of individualism. And that's a significant context for Christians to be aware of. For example, how much advertising in New Zealand centers around, it's all about you. Would you say that much of our advertising techniques focuses on, this is all about you? A better you. What do you want? We're here to help you. Buy our product and you'll have a better life. You'll feel better. You'll be able to do all those things you want to do because it's all about you. Or how much is advertising all about promoting all about your family and community? Why don't you buy this to help your family and community? Why don't you sacrifice this for the benefit of your family and community? You see much of that advertising? All right, so, so advertisers are paid big bucks to make sure that businesses, widget companies, get their money by you buying their thing. So they, they really are only going to cater to what you want. So, so if your society says, well, actually, um, we're individualistic, we really have our own pursuits, and if you can feed that, then we'll buy your product. So that's what they're targeting. They're not targeting a communal view of life. 
Good to step back and have a look at how this works. In general terms, and, and this is only a generalization, it's not true in every situation, but generally westernized societies are largely individualistic and non-western or indig- indigenous societies are often collective or com- communal. So use the word collectivist, which is also communal. You can use either of those words up there. But consider this descriptor. Collectivism stresses the importance of the community while individualism is focused on the rights and concerns of each person. Where unity and selflessness or altruism are valued traits in collective cultures, independence and personal identity are promoted in individualistic cultures. For example, workers who live in a collectivist culture might strive to sacrifice their own happiness for the greater good of the group. Those from individualistic cultures, on the other hand, may feel that their own well-being and goals carry greater weight. Can you see some New Zealand traits? You see it come out in politics. This is all about the individual. This is all about your rights. This is all about your individual freedoms. That's individualism. Collectivism is kind of like, you're individual what? This is about us, together. A culture, a community, a whānau. In fact, some of you will work with people who have migrated to New Zealand to earn money to be sent back to extended family, maybe be even sent back to parents, and that's the norm of their culture. And you'll at the same time be working alongside other people who are really focused on their own career development, their own career advancement, and they're celebrated for those career achievements for the individual. We each will come from a specific cultural context that impacts how we see life. And that shouldn't be a judgment. Also, being in an individualistic culture does not mean that you have a selfish character. Selfishness can corrupt character in any context. So we're not talking about that. There's some perspectives around this and differences, and it's good to step back and go, what is our context here? It's important to understand how that cultural context, context impacts how we read the Bible and how we relate to God and his kingdom. So often, if you come from an individualistic societal background, you'll read the scriptures about a relationship between you and God. This is about, just about me and him. And I've heard some things come out from people at times where, where they're, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. I don't go to church, but I'm, but I'm a Christian. This is all about a personal relationship with God. It all comes back to this individualistic way of viewing Scripture. And then you find Scriptures that reinforce that view. You know the prayer we talked about a few weeks ago, the prayer Jesus gave the disciples? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Whose Father? doesn't say your Father. doesn't say my Father. It says our Father. We're in this together. This is a family prayer. Together. It's a different way of reading it. But often when we think about some of those things, we only think about the individual. Now, the individual is important. And that is absolutely reflected throughout the scriptures. But we just have to stop and think about our cultural context. Because that often is a filter and a lens to the way we think about our lives, what God has got us here for, and what the scriptures say. The majority of cultures that you will be reading about in your Bible are communal or collective cultures, they're not individualistic. That's actually the context that you're reading when you're reading the Scriptures. But when we see the ministry of Jesus and the teaching of the Bible, we see that God's kingdom transcends all cultures. It connects the individual with God and his kingdom and calls forth the unique gifting and contribution of the individual. But it also unites us together in in a communal way where we're part of one family with one Heavenly Father and one kingdom that we're all called to seek and serve together. So yes, the individual is saved. Yes, the individual has a relationship with God. Yes, the individual has gifts to contribute to the common good of the family and house of God, the people of God. So it's the individual in a context of the communal. When considering much of New Zealand society uh, as, as being individualistic, it can be difficult to relate to the communal aspect of God's kingdom, his church, and his family that you'll be reading about both in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. 
And that's important to be aware of when considering why each of us is a part of Legacy Community Church and how we can perceive and commit to what God is doing here. Us. The us picture. Are we committing to the family of God and the collective mission of the church, or are we just here for our personal and individual religion? Again, very strong cultural traits will determine how we see our life here. Another way of seeing this is how many people, when looking for a church to join, are looking for how the church will meet their need and their preferences compared to how they can belong and contribute to a community that connects others in. That is, if I'm looking for a church to join, I'm working out what I want, or am I working out, is this a place where I can contribute, where I've got a part to play? Is this a a place that's about the community and about mission and about the family of God and, and that I can play a part in that and actually contribute? Or is this a place where I can come and get something for me? God wants to be surrounded by his children who love him, who love each other, and together with his son Jesus will inherit and rule his kingdom forever. That's a collective or communal concept. Each individual has a part to play and will be powerfully provided for and blessed, but only if we commit to being part of God's family, not individual members of a religion. We're here to be a community of people. Again, some of this we've just got to stop and, and just take some time to step back and think this through. Is this... Are you here today for your personal religion? This is me doing my religion today. And I've said my prayers, I've sung my song, I've listened to the word, and now I'm heading home to do my thing. I'll be back next Sunday to do the same thing, because it is, it is my religious activity that I do. Or are you part of a church family? Are you part of the family of God? Are you a member, a contributing member of a family group? They're two different perspectives, aren't they? We are to be, our mission, a community of worshipping disciples, overflowing with God's love and presence, serving and transforming lives, communities and generations with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's an us thing. As we consider our role individually and collectively in God's purpose, we see that context matters. And I want to keep on recalling Isaiah 43. We've had this uh, over the church for a number of years now. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a what thing? A new thing. Now it springs up. Do not perceive it. I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. So what's new in our context? We need A new perspective for a new season in the mission that God has called us to. So think these two things. One, facility mission, and two, fellowship mission. Last week we reviewed some of our history as a church and saw that our church actually was born out of mission activity. It was a group of people who who were doing mission in this community. They weren't a church here. They were a mission outreach. And then they decided to get this piece of land that you're in today and start building that they might have a house to become a church family on mission. That's our DNA. And I love that DNA. It's a church born out of that mission of God. And we need to see that God has called us to this land and to create a living space, an environment of manakitanga, the fellowship and hospitality of kingdom family. The Māori term manakitanga can be defined as hospitality or kindness, generosity, support, the process of showing respect, generosity, and care for others. It's a powerful term, but that term for us, it needs a home. So we're building a physical house, where we can be a family in fellowship, the Greek word koinonia, a place that God can bring his children home to. So our church, this mission, needs a home. It needs a physical place on earth. 
And that's what that first generation here was thinking of. They were doing this mission, they are using people's homes, they are using the local primary school, they are on mission in the community, but then they decided it's time. We need to start building. We need a piece of land. We need to start building and become a church on mission. This mission needs a home. That's where it comes from. And that's the same for us today. For some Christians, this can be a hard concept to grasp because they lack a theology for material things. That is, some people think that the kingdom of God is only a spiritual reality, not at all interested in physical things. And some of that comes from teaching 2,000 years ago, nearly, where uh, there's different kind of religions and even different sects within Christianity that says the material world does not matter, only the spiritual world matters. In fact, some taught that this, the material world is, world is bad. It's kind of, oh, that's interesting. But didn't God create the material world? world? Genesis 1, God creates our world, creates the home there. And after he creates it, he looks back over and says, it's all very bad. No, he says it's all very good. So we need to have that theology of, hang on, the material world that God made is very good. He made it very good. That's a good thing. It's a provision of God. He makes the earth, and then he gives it to us. And on the earth, Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 3, we see that he has set apart this area of delight. The word Eden meaning happiness, delight. Think paradise. That's what it's really saying. In that area, he would set apart a special garden for man to dwell in with God, a home. God even had a certain place for Israel. Centuries later, millennia later actually, God gives Israel a place to live, a a land to possess and dwell upon with great prosperity. It says there are even cities built there and vineyards planted they did not plant. God prepared a place for them. God gave Moses very clear and highly detailed plans for the building of the tabernacle. A mobile house for God to dwell in with his people. That was the whole point of it. But when you read through Exodus and some of the other books, there you see this really high detail building program of specific materials that need to be used, specific colors that need to be used, specific decorations that need to be used, a specific arrangement, dimensions were given. God was in high detail architect of the tabernacle. And we see that again, <clears throat> Sometime later with Solomon, he was given very high detailed plans of the temple, God's house that would be permanent in the land that he'd given the people. Revelation 21, 22, we're told of a new heaven and a new earth in the age to come, except in those two chapters, we aren't told hardly anything about it. What we're told about in those last two chapters is the city of God, the new holy city coming down out of heaven, and God dwells in the city with his people. Revelation 21 says, and now God will be with his people, and his people will be with his God, with, with him, with God. That's the whole point. That's what he's trying to get us to. But it's got this description, two chapters describing the city where God will dwell with his people. Well, apparently God's big on architecture. He's big big on places, land, building a home for his family. Now, not all things in God's kingdom are about places and buildings, not at all. But some are, and that's where we have to tune into, what does this mean, Lord? For this church, we're not just building a a facility to make our programs and meetings more convenient. The facility we're building is part of and key to the mission. It's not a convenient optional extra. And this is really important to understand about the new thing that God is doing here. We're familiar with programmed gatherings, and these are helpful and will continue. But the next step in our mission is learning how to do non-programmed family life. Or fellowship is the word used in the New Testament. The Greek of fellowship is koinonia. For example, there are times in most families when you were growing up that you would gather together for a meal, hopefully. Anyone familiar with that? The evening dinner? That is a program time. It's a crude way of saying it, I know. 
but helpful for what we're talking about. Someone had to go and shop for the food. People had to prepare the food. Food. Someone set the table and have the food ready for the family at a certain pre-organized time for everyone to gather. And at that time, I don't know how it works in your house when you're growing up, but quite often they'd be yelling in our house. The yelling is, tea time! And the expectation is that people would leave wherever they are in the house and come to the dining room for the family meal. In fact, for some of you, there might be a bit of irritation if you prepare over the last couple of hours a nice meal and people decide not to come because they're still playing video games. I won't mention names. But it's going, no, 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 no. Now is the time. It's been prepared for now. You know it's about this time. It's been, the call has been given. It is time to come eat the food together. Is it really about nutrition? Partly. But really it's about something else, isn't it? The fellowship. The relationship. The now time we set apart to be together. Eating and drinking, talking, relating. That's a program time. A plan time. A set time. And that is important. We need that. The dining and kitchen area is usually the most common space for unprogrammed inter- interaction because it's the prepared space most suitable for natural human connection. Have a think about that. That there is the program time, but then there's an unprogrammed time. And then there's the specific spaces that are in our design architecturally, which is nothing new in New Zealand. But have a think about the importance and the significance of the dining area and kitchen. How important is that space when people just find that they're heading to the pantry at the same time, to the fridge at the same time? It may not be the program dinner time. It might be 3.30 in the afternoon. It might be 9.30 at night. For some people in our household who are adult males, it might be 12.30 a.m., 1.30 a.m. There's some noise coming from the kitchen, and there's talking going on. What's going on? Well, it just happens to be the place, the bumping space, the place where you find people hanging around in the kitchen or sitting at the dining table. It's not programmed, it's not planned. It's the natural result of a space prepared for connection. Now, this isn't just a cultural thing in some of the homes we've grown up in. It's cultural throughout the world. Not necessarily that all cultures and places have a dining table or a dining room. But they have times programmed for meals, and then they have the times, the spaces where people gather and connect informally, unprogrammed. And this is what I want you to have a think about. There's a concept within this that we're working on, that we're planning for. Program times are important and good, but there's another thing that we're coming into. Consider the new entry in rooms that we're about to open the next couple of months. So you see down the back there, there's some kind of doors uh, and gaps there, and there's been construction and odds and ends, and many of you are not quite sure what's going on down there, but you don't really go down there because you know it's kind of under construction. But what is going on down there? Now, I don't know if you're very good with 2D plans. I'm very sorry. Some people find it hard to see. But that pointy bit of the triangle is the front of the old chapel. That is going down here to the gym where you're seated now. And that front there is actually the main entry. So the entry that most of you have come through, nearly everybody, is the, called the north entry to the car park. That's actually not the main entry. It's the main entry at the moment because it's not really working yet. But we're just about to finish that, and that's actually the main entry. And then you come in, into the north, you've got the Nicholas room. The kids are there now. To the south is the canteen, and to the east, here, where we're sitting, is the gym. And that's a simple layout plan. But what we need to see in that is what it means for this facility to become our church's home. Not just rooms for programs. You know that you can have a house, but is a house a home? When does it become a home? And the people there functioning as a family. So have a think about what we're doing here in this next stage. We're encouraging people to come in. And we're encouraging them to come in any time during opening hours. Not just when it's program time. 
any time that the facility is open, come on down and you'll be welcomed. And to the north is our lounge. To the east is our playroom. To the south is our dining room. Come on in. Jugs on. There might be a program to be part of. There may not be. Just come, have a drink, make yourself at home. Connect. After this point, we've constructed many rooms that can be booked for different kinds of programs, meetings, and support. And they're so helpful, they'll continue to get well used. But the next stage is something different. It's a welcoming area, a dining room where people can come in any time during open hours and make themselves at home, make themselves at our home. Where people from this church can connect with them and include them, where you can minister God's grace to them. You, as God's children, as members of the household, and as I was preaching on earlier in the year, as priests. Now take away your, your church context of, of some of the mainline systems of traditional priesthood and think about the Bible talking about you being a holy priesthood. What happens when you've got a holy priesthood in the house and people are coming in from the community? Now you've got a ministry team. It's the family just being family, loving people that are coming in. Can you see the switch? Not just rooms for programs, but an opening time with this whole spirit of manakitanga, of welcome and hospitality, where we tell people the doors are open, this place is open for you. We, the church, we're just hanging out here, being a church, doing life as a family. And we encourage you to come on in. Help yourself to a hot drink. They'll be free. Instant hot drink something. We have a cafe bar there and work out. We do some events and that. But the point is they'd have open hours where people just come on in, hang out, whether there's a program on or not. Come into the dining room, have a drink. There's be some lovely people here that will welcome you. And hopefully we can connect you in to the point where manakitanga becomes whanaungatanga, where you become part of the family. They might play some pool or a board game. They might grab something from the resource area, do some reading. Or they might just sit there and enjoy the presence of God, listen to some of the worship music being played on the screen in the canteen there, the dining room. No money needed. It's free for all. Just come on and help yourself. And we want this to start from term three. And also, we want to start doing a free community lunch once a week as well, and maybe that'll increase. And who knows what else you might provide here in the coming years when we think about this as a place for us to dwell as a family, as a fellowship, and to invite people into. This next stage of mission is going to have a facility that it won't just be rooms for groups to use, but a spiritual home to the people of this community. When the door is open, just come on in. You're welcome. We want you here we want you to belong with us. And what we're looking at doing, developing, is that for starting in term three for four days a week, we want the, the doors, the op- official opening hours between uh, 10 a.m. and 1.30 p.m. for four days a week and see how that grows in the time ahead. But when people are told and we communicate that, we say if that's the opening hours, you don't have to come to a program. Even if there's not a program on, if it's opening hours, just come on down. There'll be people here, there'll be life here, there'll be a dining room, you're invited. And in the evenings, we're going to open it up more often for people to come and play, eat together, just hang out, hang out, just like in, uh, June 30th on Matariki Sunday, we're going to be doing that here. And we're going to encourage people, would you like to do something like that? Is there something you'd like to contribute? Is there some things you'd like to do? Maybe some of our young ones want to open up after school and invite young ones from the community. It's just, we're building the shell, we're building the building. It's we who fill it and bring the life. That's the shift, the new thing. God wants us to construct a place where his children can come home to. But coming home requires a home to come to. 
That's the difference in construction. We're building something with us that becomes a home that people can come to. And that's why in Acts chapter 2, it talks about this amazing fellowship of God's people. And God added to their number daily those being saved. He added to them. He didn't add them to a meeting. He didn't add them to a building. He added them to a community of fellowship of people. That's where we're going. So what's new about the season ahead? Think about facility as being part of the mission. Not just a tool for some programs. It's a place that represents a spiritual home, a community to belong to, and a home you can enjoy fellowship in. And secondly, think fellowship mission. The facility part of the mission can only work if there's a fellowship of believers dwelling here. No use opening the doors, but having it empty of welcome and love, right? Last week I talked about the koinonia, the fellowship nature of the church, In the book of Acts, we see the Holy Spirit's community, the spirit-birthed family of God at the start of Acts chapter 2. And it says in verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. That's that Greek word koinonia. To the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Remember, that was the house of God, the temple. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That is a picture of God's house where his family is home with him, enjoying him, enjoying one another, and everyone being taken care of. In other words, it's a picture of heaven on earth. That's what you see in Genesis chapter 2 and 3. That's what you see in Revelation 21, 22. God on earth at home with his people. That's how powerful the concept of fellowship is in the kingdom of God. That Greek word for fellowship, Koinonia, it's a community of social and spiritual partnership that results in contribution and distribution. That's a big concept to do with this this Greek word is there's a contribution that people bring and in the contribution there's a distribution so that people are taken care of. There's a commonality, that is that it's not about just what what I've got for me but it's what I'm bringing for us and we distribute that to those who have needs and that's why Acts chapter 4 says that they had no needs in the church. People came with needs but they are sorted because there's a distribution to take care of the needs. Amazing picture. The thing we need to catch as a church is that God's children whom he wants to bring home need for us, the church, to be that fellowship, that family here. God wants to bring people home to his family, not just to an empty house. And there are people here who might organize some shared dinners or some games nights or some open times in the evening when people from the community can come and join us as we enjoy fellowship together. That's what I want you to see about our fellowship mission. You don't have to wait for a program or a meeting to be organized. You can just come down and have fellowship. You can just enjoy being in relationship and welcome visitors as long lost relatives. It's a different way of doing and seeing mission. We've been doing it in part for a long time. You see that uh, when we gather for the youth centre or we gather for live community through the week or gather for the SWAP program, for sport or for our worship services on Sunday. But what happens when we just gather to be family? Now, all those things are super important, but I believe God's calling us into something more. What happens when we just gather to be family? Because I believe that's what God can add his children to. That's how the church grew. It's a different way of doing and seeing mission. That's when the Lord adds to the number daily those who are being saved. Really important to stop and think about that. That little yellow statement at the end there. God was adding the numbers. Now, we're called to go out into the world, preach the good news, 
And that's always got to be happening. But here, when the Holy Spirit births the church, they're just enjoying fellowship together. They're enjoying being together with the Father. Amazing things are happening. They're looking after one another. And God is bringing people in to connect into that family, that fellowship. Not just a program. This is a way of life. So, think a season of harvest. What does that look like? Well, I reckon that's what it looks like. I think we've already got the description. I think we've already got the blueprint. It's already written in there. And that's what I want to encourage us to be in prayer about and to think about how do we respond to the new thing that God's doing. A key aspect of what Fellowship or Kononia is about is the shared contribution of the whole community. So, as I finish up this series, I want you to think about your response. What's your contribution? And there's three things I want to encourage you about this whole year of contribution. Thinking about this and from the, the point of view of Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4, uh, they didn't view their possessions as their own. They gave what they had so all could benefit. There he goes, 2 verse 44, it says, All the believers were together and had everything in common. Now the word common there doesn't mean that they, they all look the same. They all, oh yeah, they must be all the same set of twins there. It doesn't mean that. The Amplified Version says it this way, All those who had believed in Jesus as Savior were together and had all things in common, considering their possessions to belong to the group as a whole. That is, for the common good. You'll read it again in 1 Corinthians 12 about all the different gifts and workings of the Holy Spirit given for the common good. It is for the together part. Considering their positions to belong to the group as a whole. That's what you see in Acts chapter 2. You see it again in Acts chapter 4. It says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything that they had. It was an attitude. It was a heart. There's love that flowed out of them that actually, I've got something that can help that. I'll give it. You've got a need. I've got a supply. Let's make this work. I just see it as the practicality of love. And a good percentage of people in this church give some of their time in serving. And I think that's a strength for us. A good number of people here give something financially to the church. And I think that's a strength for us. But for us to enter into this next season of mission harvest, we're going to need to use a new level of faith. And I mean faith, not just belief. You can agree with this and say you believe in it, but faith is the activity of your belief. It's what you do because of what you believe. So our response has to always be in faith. The promises and provisions of God's kingdom are only accessed by faith. So this is always key. Whatever you're hearing in the word of God, how do you respond in faith? That is, how do you put this into action? Because if it doesn't come out in action, then you're not living by faith. You're living by something else, and you have a set of beliefs. Faith is the activity of what we believe. So what's my response? What do I do about this? Three things that we each need to think about responding to with what God is calling us to be and to do. First, give, as I did in the New Testament, resource in money. And that's why I handed out those flyers this morning asking every household think about what they can contribute to complete these facilities. At the moment, we won't have enough money to complete the kitchen area there, uh, and we don't have any money yet for the auditorium. But as we each work out our contribution, then we, together we pray, God, would you bless and multiply and supply what we need for the completion? Bring it into a place of abundance that we'd have more than enough for our own needs, that we'd have a supply to share with others that are in need, both here in this community and in other churches. But what's your contribution? What part can you play when it comes to the cost? Give time in prayer. Can I ask every household that is part of this church to set aside time in prayer for this church and mission? If you can't come down to one of the prayer meetings because of the timing, set aside a couple of specific times each week where you'll uphold the fellowship and mission and needs of the church. Don't leave prayer for someone else. We all are needed because we're in a spiritual battle where the enemy doesn't want this place completed, where the enemy doesn't want us enjoying the fellowship of the Father's house, where he doesn't want God's lost children coming home and being healed, saved, discipled, transformed. You know that you're in a spiritual battle. 
There is a work already in place trying to prevent these things from happening. We can strive in our best efforts, but there's a prayer that we're given to bring that breakthrough. And so we're to be a house of prayer. We're to be a people of prayer. There's some things that we won't access and, sh- and shift through prayer. But we can't, we can't delegate that to someone else. Oh, Nigel, he's a pastor. He can go and pray. Well, I have been praying. But this is a us thing together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Give us each day our daily bread. That is the supply for us. What do we need? Well, that's a prayer that we have to pray together. And it's very easy in a New Zealand society to leave out prayer and say, well, I'll I'll give something or I'll go help. Uh, Prayer, I don't know, not that important. And, of course, that's the great deception of the enemy. Prayer's not that important. I'll do something. Do something by faith and pray. Because if you're not praying, then you're missing out on the battle aspect, which means the enemy is already active and spiritually we're lagging behind. So I want to encourage you, give time in prayer. And lastly, give love in fellowship. Start thinking about how you can spend time here each week connecting with others, welcoming and visitors. Some of you will have time through the morning so you can come down and be part of it. Some might have time in the afternoon. Some will have some time in the evenings. We all need to eat, so why don't you come down and eat together? Most of us like to play, so why don't you come on down and play together? You got kids? Well, I think you'll find that they like to eat and play. And when you clear out all these seats, and when you open up the canteen, what a place. It's your place. Not just a building. It could be a home. How do we make that happen? I want you to encourage you to pray, think about that. And think about, well, hmm, I guess I do come from maybe an individual way of seeing things, and this is just my religion. How can I change this to where we can do this as a family, as a fellowship, and actually have this place being a place where people can come to and connect relationally? connect with the family of God and then connect with the Heavenly Father. What actions of faith will you take? Because it doesn't matter how good our leaders are in their organisational skill. We can't organise love. We can't organise faith. We can't organise koinonia or fellowship. These are the things that flow out of a loving family, not an institution. That's where we're going. What does a loving family look like in the season ahead? With God the Father present, with the blessing of the church, people giving and sharing and providing for one another. Man, that's a place I want to go to. And that's the place that we're promoting in the community. What are we going to be going forward, church? Choose today your faith response.